that up. And this down, tools, share, share, window. Okay, so we started recording. This is our okay. Recording. My thing is working. Um, this is our lecture. Well, this is the first lecture of our first, our second exam. So our second exams, I think we'll have also about three or four uh, chapters that we are going to cover. Uh, for that, impression materials will be the main ones, and it'll be a lot of fun in the lab. Uh, we'll start mixing impression materials. This week, we're going to mix algin, and next few weeks, we might actually do three weeks of uh, algin of impression mixing. We have a lot of types of impression materials. Um, they're definitely important to get to know each one of them and how to use it. Uh, there will be a lot of fun again in the lab, uh, but we'll get to know a few things here in the lecture that will prepare you guys for the lab. So we're going to talk about impression materials, and we have, again, two lectures of the impression materials as we move forward. But um, mainly what we mean by impression materials is the materials that we use to actually take the registration, take a replica of the patient mouth, and then we'll use it to pour a cast or a model for the patient. So like the casts that we did in the lab, we use a mold, you know, these red molds technically uh, represent an impression that we took for the patient. Uh, so the, how many of you guys have taken, you know, been, and you know, taken impressions on? Yeah. Okay, so not bad. The kind of guy's been there. Do you know? Do you know what uh, what impression material they used on you? No. What? Purple. Purple. Okay. Did they mix it with water? Yes. yes. Most probably it's the alginate, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we know it's again. You know, we use it to make sure that we will. Uh, be able to do uh, different things. So if we want to make crowns, if we want to make bridges, if we want to make almost any kind of appliances or even study models, we have to take the impression first, right? We know we did talk about the casts and technically what the casts do, that's what the impression do in the first place. You know, we take the impression to make the casts that we can use to all to do all these different things. So an impression, we said a cast is a positive reproduction, right? So the impression is a negative. negative, exactly. So it's a negative reproduction of the mouth. We understand what that means. So it actually takes the shapes of the teeth. So when you pour them, you can actually have the actual representation of the mouth. And we have three types of impressions based on these. Remember we said also we have different casts. We have like study models and we have uh, working models, right? All of these. So kind of the impressions are similar. We're talking here about the impression based on what do we use it for. So we have three categories, pre preliminary, final, and bytes registration. So three types of impressions when we take an impression and this is technically based on what we're going to use them for in a way by registration and we're going to talk about each one of these in the next slides So one thing to know, as dental assistants, 
we are not able to take a final impression. We're not allowed to take a final impression. We're allowed to assist with that. We can take preliminary impression, which we're going to take in the lab later on. We can take bite registrations, but we cannot take a final impression. Because remember, anything that we do, we should not be technically final. Although again, an impression doesn't really hurt a patient or nothing that we're doing on the patient teeth, but it still is considered as a final work. So we cannot technically take it on our own. We would be there and assist the dentist to take it. So this is technically what you're looking at here. This is a preliminary impression. This is a final one and this is an occlusal one. And again, we're going to get to know each one of them with each uh, slide as we go further. But these are the three types and from the names, I mean, technically, the preliminary, you do things that are, you know, just to study, just to see the patient, just, you know, not something that you do for final, for big work. Uh, the final impression is the one that you're going to send to the lab for the lab to do the work for you, right? To make your crowns, bridges. And then the bite registration is just to register the occlusion of the patient, as we'll see in a little bit. So there are some properties that we want in an alginate, um, in an impression in general. Uh, we want it to be tear resistant when we remove it from the mouth, you know, because it will be stuck in the mouth and we have to kind of pull it down. And if it tear, that will change the dimension. So we want to do that. And same thing with the dimensional stability. So we want it to be stable and we want it to be as accurate as possible to make sure that we're recording or we're actually getting all the fine details that are in the patient mouth because these things can be really small. Our teeth are small already, and we're trying to prepare a crown or a bridge. We have to drill it a little bit smaller, and then we have to capture these details for sure to make sure that the crowns would adjust completely to it and all of that, anyway. So, for the preliminary impressions, these are the first impressions that we're going to talk about. So do you think they require high accuracy or not? You need a lot of accuracy if you're taking just a first one. No, so this does not require high accuracy. Take that much of accuracy. You just want to see general idea. You just want to get the general anatomy of the teeth. You don't want to get that deep into like capturing only one tooth details, but you're just capturing a whole arch in general. So you do not really require, for things that does not require much higher accuracy. So uh, if you see these on the side, what do you think are, you know, which ones of these will, will use the pre uh, preliminary impressions to take? So implants, do you think we take uh, uh, an impression? No, for implants, right? How about study models? Yes, about custom trays. How about crown and bridges? No, right, widening trays, night guards, yes. So let's take a look at these things. So as you can see, these are the things that uh, a preliminary impression are used to take. So study models like the ones that we've done, again, it doesn't require much accuracy we're not going to do any type of work on it. We're just using it to study so we can use it with a preliminary impression. Custom trays, that means, well, we'll get to that, meaning that if we want to take a better impression, we'll make our own type of tray, you know, based on the first impression that we take. So we take an impression, we pour a model, and then we make another tray to take an impression with to make it fit more. We do custom uh, provisional restorations, which means temporary restorations sometimes. Whitening trays, uh, we can do that because again, it just gives us the general, a general look of the teeth. Night guards and sports, sport guards also. Some removable orthodontic appliances. Material used and tray used, we're going to get to that as we go further and we can go back to this to answer it, okay? 
So this is our preliminary impression. Technically, it is mainly alginate, which we're going to talk about in a second. We're good. Moving on. Yes. Okay. Now, the second type of impression is the final impression. And this one is the ones that will have much more quality and more accuracy when we are taking an impression. So they good, provide good fit, marginal integrity. And we can take this impression when we want to make crowns, bridges, inlays, onlays. Inlays and onlays are a type of um, uh, filling material, which you guys are going to know later. When we're planning to place implants, full dentures, and partial dentures as well. So you can see that, you know, the difference between the preliminary impression material and the final impression material. Generally, the preliminary, again, it just makes, it doesn't have high accuracy. It's just accurate enough to do the things that we want, you know, just a study model, widening tray, these things. But if we want to make crowns, bridges, inlays, onlays, implant, dentures, so the major things, the actual uh, restorative work that we do, we actually need a final impression, okay? We're going to get to know the material and the tray use later on. But as you can see, like generally in this impression, you notice that we're actually using two types of material instead of one, right? It has two colors that we're actually, that means we're using two materials to take that final impression. And they do that because we want to get really more accuracy. And again, you know, when you think about these crowns and bridges, inlays or in onlays, implants, it's like a specific area that we, you want the right and the specific details on. And that's why, again, we take the final impression um, with different type of material to make sure that we have more accurate representation and better fit. So the bite registration is the last type of impression that we take technically. And this is the bite registration. So you see, well, first it doesn't have a, a tray that you're actually putting it on, right? Like on the other ones, you see, this is a tray that we are using, right? On this one, we are actually also using a tray but with the bite registration, we're not using a tray most of the time. And guess what it is uh, for? It's a replication of the patient's bite, exactly. So what do you think why we actually take an impression of the patient bite? So we took, for example, we took the maxillary and we make a model, a cast. And then we took the mandibular impression and we made a cast, right? Then why do we take the bite? Yeah, to know how it will bite, right? So we can see how the patient bite and we can actually mount it and replicate it in the lab. Because when we send these things to the lab and they want to make a crown, for example, on the maxillary arch, they need to know the relationship between the maxillary and the mandibular when the patient bites, right? Because if they make it too long, it will touch the mandibular arch. So how would the lab technician know where to stop when they're making the crown? What is the bite of the patient by providing them with the bite registration? So if you see the next slide, it's just the pictures. This is another type of bite registration. I mean, it can be done with wax. It can be done with other type of material. We don't do it with wax that often, but you see what we did here after we did it with wax, after we did it with wax, we actually mounted the maxillary and the mandibular based on the bite registration. So you see the bite registration will give you the teeth location on both arches. And technically like this is a material that we place on the patient teeth and ask them to bite. And then once they bite, we take it off the patient and again, send it to the lab so the lab would know exactly how to, how uh, the teeth are in relationship with each other. So this 
would sit here, this one would sit here, this one would sit here, and we'll give you, is it forward or is it backwards? Because again, it must fit. Once we do that, you can see on the other picture, they put it on this device, and this is called an articulator, and this is again the device that will replicate the patient bite, and you can see they kind of stuck it together, and they will pour the model here to make sure it stays, and then this would replicate the patient bite, and now we don't need the bite registration anymore, because this would open and close, and you'll get the patient bite. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, when we're taking an impression, we definitely need something to put the impression inside the patient mouth, right? So we use trays, and I'm sure you've kind of seen trays before. These are an example of trays. So we're going to know what types of trays that we have. Uh, generally, we have two types of trays. We have stock trays, which are prefabricated. And we have custom made trays. So these are the ones that we are actually going to make specifically for our patients. So we take an impression, we pour a model, and then we make something to make it look like another tray. And then we take an impression again with that to make a final impression. Usually with final impressions, we use custom trays. For regular first impressions or preliminary impressions, we take the stock trays. So let's just get to know the types of the trays. You can see, I just gave you examples here. For example, A is a full arch. You can see we're capturing the whole arch, the mandibular and maxillary. And you know, guys, which one is the mandibular, which one is the maxillary tray? The one on the left? The left, yeah, the maxillary, right? So that's the maxillary there. And again, we're going to do this in the lab and this is the mandibular because the mandibular, you have the tongue space here. So it's an open for the tongue space. Same thing here. We have a mandibular, same thing here. We have a mandibular because of the tongue space. Anyway, so again, these are just example to get to know. So this is metal because the material is made of metal, still stock trays, still prefabricated. We didn't make it in the lab. We just purchase it as is. Definitely, they come in different sizes, usually three sizes, small, medium, and large, all of that. And you can see they're perforated because they have these openings in them. And guess what? why we make these openings for? So that the impression material will go through it and get stuck to it. So that the impression material will get stuck to the tray. It helps the impression to stay on the tray when we take it out of the patient mouth because sometimes... <laughs> with the ones that are not uh, uh, perforated, you take the tray and the material sucks in the mouth. <laughs> you know, it's still in the mouth of the patient. It doesn't come out with the tray. So that's why we use sometimes adhesives or we use the perforations. Anyway, that is one type. And then you have the rim lock, which can be perforated or not. And technically a rim lock are the ones that you see the margins are a little bit more raised and kind of rotated. So the margins of these are rotated here. These are technically rim lock, non-perforated ones. And these are even more special. Uh, they're not used that much anymore. You can see we have water coming in to cool it down and water coming out. And again, this is for special material, which is the agar, the irreverse, the reversible hydrocolloid that we're going to talk about later. But anyway, these trays are not much used anymore. The ones that, you know, cooled down, most probably not going to see. But anyway, and these are the plastic ones that are perforated as well, and these are disposable. Now a lot of offices use the disposable ones just because it's much easier to work with. More, so let's leave that in there, the empty one. We have triple trays, which are these ones. And these ones are different from all the other trays that we talked about because they take the impression for both arches and they will also provide a bite registration. So we put material on one side and then flip it and put the material on the other side. Again, it will make much more sense when we use it in the lab, but for now, let's get to know these. So this is one. 
Guess what D is for? You can see that D impression tray doesn't have any borders, right? It doesn't have like the borders that we have on these. So this is for what? What type of impression? Bytes. Yes, exactly. The byte registration. It is not used often. It It's based on the dentist because usually with the byte registration, you don't really need an impression, uh, a tray. You can just put it on the patient teeth and you're good. And the last ones here, number F, you see they're different, right? Like this one. What is this one capturing? It's capture. Is it capturing the full mouth? No. So it's capturing one, one side and quadrant. Yes, quadrant. That's what we call it. We call them quadrant trays. Because you can take an interior quadrant, a posterior quadrant, and so on. By the way, triple trays also come in quadrant. So like these multiple trays that we see also, they come in quadrant. I mean, even the metal ones come in quadrant. So it's, you know, it can be plastic and it can be metal. It can be triple tray. It can be anything. And even here, I mean, you see that the... Byte registration ones, they also come in quadrant, as you can see. We're good with the trays. So the trays are used to put the impression inside the patient mouth. We have general ones that are stock made, and we have custom one that we're going to talk about. But generally, you know, these uh, trays, all of them, other than the multiple trays, take one impression, one arch at a time. The only ones that take both arches and a bite are the multiple trays, as you can see here. And again, we're going to use it in the lab and it will make even more sense. So the custom trays, as you can see here, we have a cast already, you know, taken from the patient. And we will make this thing that looks like a tray on top of that cast to get much more better details when we take the next impression, which will be the final impression. So if you want to make a custom made casts, you have to take a you know, primary impression or first impression, you pour a, a model of it, a cast, and then you make a one uh, custom tray, you can use it for final impression. So the custom trays are made on, huh? Yeah, kind of, the patient casts, yeah, patient casts. Which meaning like we have to take an impression of the patient, pour the model to make a cast, and then we can make a custom tray. It can be done with different materials. Again, we're going to do that in the lab, most probably next semester. Um, and it can also be made with thermoplastic resins, which we'll do in both. This is the thermoplastic resin, and we have the chemical materials, which are technically... Uh, So that is the custom made trays. And you can see even sometimes we make the perforations ourselves for the custom made trays, like this one, we made the perforation for it. Now we're getting to the juicy stuff, talking about the actual dental impression materials. What we were talking about, the, the, the trays, uh, the impression itself, is it primary, is it final? But now we're going to talk about the actual materials that we use in dentistry to take the impressions. So we have two main categories. We have elastic materials and we have inelastic materials. And guess which ones we're using? Elastic ones, right? So the inelastic ones, let's get rid of that at first. These are the ones that have been used before, before the development of the elastic materials. And you can see, for example, impression plaster. Remember, we were talking about plaster. We have impression plaster, which is type what? What type of gypsum is impression plaster? 
type one. Impression plaster is type one, and then we have model plaster that is type two and so on. So anyway, impression plaster is used to, technically you're, you're mixing a plaster and then you put it in a tray and put it inside patient mouth, waiting for it to dry, breaking it, and then taking it apart and then gluing it back together to get the patient impression. So, you know, thankfully we're not there anymore. Uh, dental compound is another plasticky thing that we kind of put in hot water and then we can melt it down a little bit, put it inside patient mouth. But again, it's too rigid. Again, it's not used that much anymore. Zinc oxide, usually sometimes used, but again, with the new impression materials, we're not using it that much. And impression wax, which is again, like you saw the picture, uh, we had, for example, a bite registration with wax. But again, it's not like the actual impression impression. So our main work would be with the elastic materials. So elastic materials have two types. One is hydrocolloid and the other one are elastomers. And we're going to talk about each. So dental materials, um, based on the material itself, what it's made of, uh, are categorized in two categories. We have elastic materials and we have inelastic. The inelastic, we have four types. So compound, impression plaster, zinc oxide eugenol, and impression wax. And for the elastic ones, we have the hydrocolloid and elastomers. Within the hydrocolloids, as you can see, we have irreversible and reversible. And within the elastomers, we have polysulfide, polyether, silicon, and hybrid. And again, we're going to talk about each one of these in the lectures as we go forward. Our lecture today mainly would focus on hydrocolloids. We got that done. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about the elastomers and go through that. Okay. We're good with the categorization now. So... When I was looking, that was even before, I think this is from 2019, I tried to find a new uh, study, but a survey generally found that most of the material used in the dentist offices are the PVS, as you can see here, which would constitute, this is 50, 17, and this. So all of that is PVS, and PVS is this material, silicon, which, you know, it's under what elastomers. So this is just to let you know that elastomers and PVS is the main used material of impression, you know, for final impressions, definitely. And for the regular impressions, alginate is the choice. So the main things that you're going to use in offices will be alginate, which is a hydrocolloid, and a silicon, which is uh, elastomer. Again, this is just to show you that this is what's out there. And definitely digital impressions are getting, you know, there more and more. Again, this is a little bit older. Uh, I didn't find any new survey, but this is, I think, like about three years ago, something like that. Moving on, hydrocolloids. So this is a material that is uh, technically glue-like material. Um, and hydrocolloid is a water-based colloid. So a water-based glue-like material, again, just to kind of define the name, what hydrocolloid mean. Hydro, water, right? And colloid is a glue-like material. Anyway, we said we have two types. Which one? One is irreversible and one is reversible. So the irreversible hydrocol is what alginate, from now on, you're going to know this name for sure. And this is the first impression material we're going to mix and practice on. And this is the impression material. So this impression material takes what impression? Is it the preliminary or the final or the bite? Preliminary right? Because <laughs> that's the one that we can work with. As I said, we cannot do final impression. We can assist on final impression. 
But these impressions, the alginate, which is the hydrocolloid, we can take. And we'll learn how to take, and you guys are going to take it on each other. And we're going to pour models, but most probably not within this semester, I think. Impressions on each other in next semester. Impressions on models this semester. We'll see. We'll, we'll take a few things, like byte registration maybe, and again, just kind of to try the impression material, just to feel how it feels, uh, but not like in a full-blown thing where we actually pour the models and do all of that. Anyway, so if we want to answer the question on the slide there, you know, for preliminary impressions, we know that the impression material uses alginate, which is a irreversible hydrocolloid, and the tray use technically can be any, but not the triple trace. Just to let you know, I mean, you don't have to put that in there. I mean, it's written in the bottom anyway in the other slide, but just to let you know that this is the answer for it. So that's, huh? Which one do you think? What is the answer? What do we take preliminary impressions with? Alginate. That's the answer. Huh? The what? Not the agar. No, no, the alginate. Well, yeah, the agar is actually more, it's more detailed. They can take final impressions with, but it's not used anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. So for hydrocolloid, again, we have two types, as we were saying, irreversible, which is uh, alginate that we take, that takes the preliminary impressions with, that's what we can take with, and reversible, that is hydrocolloid, that is not used anymore. This thing here that you look at, you see this is a tray that has also water in to cool down. This is for agar, and it's not used anymore because it requires a lot of work. So what you do with agar, you don't mix it. It's, uh, it comes in tubes. You put it in hot water bath, which you see here. This is why I put this slide here. So this is how we prepare agar. You put it in hot water bath for a while, and then you have to take it and put it in the tray, and then you have to cool it down as it's inside of the patient mouth. <laughs> so you put this inside of the patient mouth, and then you run water through it to cool it down. So it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of preparation. It is a good impression type of material. It can take really good details with the uh, reversible hydrocolloid. But again, we're not using any more because it's too much of work. And we have much better materials, which are the elastomers, that can do all of that without having to do all of this work. The thing about the reversible hydrocolloid is, again, from the name, agar can go back to, uh, to like, uh, what do you call it, like a glue-like material. So it can set and be like an impression when it cools down, but if you heat it back up, it will uh, reverse to a liquid-like material. And that's why we call it reversible hydrocolloid. While alginate, once you mix it, it's a powder and water, you mix it, it becomes, uh, it sets up and that's it. You cannot return to the watery status of it. That's why we call it irreversible. Because once it's mixed, that's it. We cannot reverse it back to its back um, stage. So we have two stages or two, whatever you want to call them, conditions for hydrocolloids. Generally, you have sol and gel. Sol, when they're mixed, like for alginate, when you mix it, and it's still workable, you can work with it, we call it sol. And gel, it's when chilled or set. So when algin is set, it forms a gel. And when it's mixed, it's formed uh, sol. I put here or heat it because you can heat agar and make it sol again. And you can chill agar and make it gel. Well, with alginate, you cannot heat it up to make it sol again. Am I making sense? I'm just saying words here. <laughs> so sol is when it's, you know, liquidy, and then gel when it's, when it's set. For agar, as we said, it's because it's reversible. We can turn it back and forth between these two 
stages. It can go back to liquid when you uh, heat it, and it can go to uh, set when you chill it. Alginate is also hydrocolloid, and it also goes through these, but it's not reversible. It just goes through sol and then gel, and that's it. We cannot reverse it. Make sense? Move on. And again, I honestly didn't want to put these in here, but I think on the RDA or something exam, you'll have a question about sol and gel. Nah, I don't know why they like them, but anyway, it's the condition that these materials pass through. It's good to know. And this is, again, this is the setup for what material? Agar, right? Agar, which is an irre uh, a reversible hydrocolloid. Okay. So this is definitely an, um, uh, an algen impression that you do not want to take. You can see they even took like the throat of the patient. So <laughs> this is a very bad impression. <laughs> It's too much material that went all in there. I don't know how it sets and they were able to take it out without the patient gagging and dying. <laughs> but anyway, so um, now we're going to talk about alginate specifically to the end of these slides and that's it, okay? So bear with me, we're there. Alginate, which is the irreversible hydrocolloid, right? So the composition, it is actually made from derivatives of the seaweed. And that's why people that have seaweed allergy can get allergic reaction to alginate. It is really rare to see that, but I have one time, one of my students, we took impressions on, and then in a little bit, after a little bit, she had a few like uh, blisters in her mouth. It's not like too bad but it's just small bubbly things that are on her tongue and her cheek. And it went out right away. It didn't really last too long, but I guess she had some allergy to seaweed. So that's a note to take. Uh, the main ingredient is potassium or sodium alginate. These are the main ingredients for it. What do we use the alginate for, the alginate impression for, as we said, preliminary right preliminary work which is diagnostic and opposing casts it can be some uh, for the partial denture framework some repairs mouth guards and bleaching trays and again when you look at these it is the exact ones that we use for the preliminary uh, impressions the main problem with alginate is that it is not accurate enough for what type of impression vinyl, vinyl impression exactly it is good, it's not that bad, but it's not accurate enough for final impression. One main thing that we use it for because it's, what dentists care about? Money, right? <laughs> so it's cheap, it's a cheap option and it's reasonably accurate, which means when we take it and we pour the things that we needed to do, it is accurate enough. Like it's accurate enough for a mouth guard. It's good enough for a bleaching tray, right? It's good enough for a custom tray. Uh, yeah, custom tray. Yes, that is alginate, exactly. Like for retainers, when they make retainers, most probably that is alginate, you know. They pour it most probably with stone, not plaster, but still they use alginate for it, right? So you can take an alginate, pour it with plaster and makes a diagnostic cast. If you take an alginate and pour it with stone, you make something to maybe do like a retainer or something like that, okay? So it is cheap. Um, we do have some kind of other replacement from the elastomeric materials that is called alginot. We'll talk about on later. But again, it is there. A lot, all offices, I would say, have it. You're going to do a lot of impressions in offices because that's one of the things that we do. So it's good to understand and know, again, all of the impression materials, especially algae. Okay. The time when it sets, so definitely it has different sets. It can have a fast and regular. I don't think you'll see slow set in offices, uh, but you'll see a fast set and a regular set. Uh, and technically they just put either uh, retardant 
to the uh, reaction to make it slower, or they, yeah, they put accelerators to make it fast. So you can see the working time for the regular uh, set time is two to three minutes. For the fast, it's one to two minutes. The setting time for it, it's about two to five and one to, you know, same thing here for the fast. So fast setting, regular setting. Uh, same with the plaster. We can adjust the uh, the setting time by making the water, by working with the water temperature. So sometimes on hot days, we would use, I would use a little bit of the, you know, water cooler water. When I'm taking impression from my patients, it's so when I get the water from the tap water, it's hot. So I go in and just get a little bit, maybe quarter of that amount of water that I need from the water cooler and put it with my mix so I get more, you know, the regular working time for my alginate. One thing to notice is that when your patient have teeth sensitivity, your 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 uh, water level, I mean, water temperature should be regular to a little bit maybe... Uh, cool to a little bit warmish because they, it can hurt their teeth. If it's too cool, it can hurt their teeth. But I mean, regular tap water temperature, you know, a cool water should be enough to get right mixing time without hurting our patients. Okay. The, again, I understand these things will make more sense when we do in the lab, but we have to put it in here anyway, so we can go back and have a reference. So the ideal thickness of it, you know, when you put it in between the tray and the and the actual alginate, do I have a picture here? Like the thickness of the alginate itself, you know, between the tray and the teeth should have about two to four milliliters. Again, uh, we're going to do that in the lab. Um, alginate can actually permanently deform. If you pull it too hard, it can change the, the shape of it. And that's why we want to remove it with a snap. So you remove it quickly, allow it some time to recover. And technically that is the time to disinfect. You know how much time or the minimum amount of time to disinfect the surface? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 25, it's about 10. So, that's a thing to think about. You know, when you're spraying something to disinfect it, you should not just wipe it right away. The actual way of doing this, most probably Ms. Jukes told you about it, is spray wipe, spray wipe. Did Ms. Jukes talk about that? Yes? Which means spray, just remove the debris or the dirty things, and then spray, leave for about 10 minutes, and then wipe. Because to disinfect something, it needs you need a lot of time. I know there in the dental office for the dental materials, sometimes we have quicker material that say they will disinfect like within five minutes or so, but there is always a need to keep the material, you know, in contact with the surface to actually disinfect it. Anyway, that's why I'm saying here, by the time you took it out of the patient mouth, you know, we said it's rapid, you take it quickly. And then because you take it quickly, it will change the dimension a little bit because it's again, it's kind of rubbery like material. So you want to leave it to kind of reform or rebound or recover. And by the time it recovers, because you have to spray it with disinfectant and leave it a little bit. So by the time the disinfectant work, which is 10 minutes, that will allow enough time for it to recover back. Does that Again, we're going to do this in the lab. We have two words that we need to know about, which is imbibe and synoresis. And this is something that is, uh, Again, one of the shortcomings of the alginate is that it can gain water and it can lose water. So if you put the alginate impression, you took the alginate impression, you put it outside like that, just on the table, you know, on the countertop, just leave it like that. What do you think will happen? Cineresis or imbibe or imbibition, if you want to. Cineresis, it will lose the water, right? Because we left it there, it will start to dry. And then if you put it and you put a lot of water on it, like you didn't dry it, for example, it will gain the water and swell. And that's why we have to pour the alginate within an hour, right? Within about an hour, that's the ideal time. 30 minutes to an hour, you have to pour the alginate impression with stone because it will change the dimensions that we took already. 
It can gain water and it can lose water. So we don't want this to happen over time. So we want to pour it with about half an hour to an hour before it changes the dimensions. And that's again, that's a shortcoming of Alginet. While the other materials, we can take an impression. We don't even have to pour it. We just send it to the lab. The lab would pour it and will do all the work for us. Okay? So that's why we have to pour Alginet in the office. And that's most probably the only thing that you pour in the office is Alginet impressions. Because again, the other type, like elastomers impressions, it will remain and keep its dimensional stability. It will not gain water or lose water because it's not even water-based. So you think too much water will do what? Make it more weak and more tear. Um, it can produce more tear to the impression. So definitely we're going to follow the manufacturer instructions for how much powder to water ratio, which again, we'll see in the lab. Once it's removed, you want to, again, these things more in the lab. But, you know, when you take the impression off, you definitely want to rinse it and disinfect it. You want to wrap it in damp paper towel, not water, not dripping wet. Again, this is to save it from drying. You put a, a like a, a paper towel that has a little bit of water in it, but not dripping. Just cover it. And it's better to put it in a Ziploc bag, again, just to keep the material from drying because we know it can dry and can lose water. So you want to pour it within? Exactly, 30 to 60 minutes. And then when we are taking our impression, we have to evaluate it again. But these are things that kind of makes sense. Same thing, almost like we looked on the, on the casts that we got. Did we get all the structures recorded? You want full depth because sometimes, you know, especially when you take your first impression, you're afraid to push it inside the patient mouth or, you know, the student, <laughs> your fellow student mouth, and you will not get the full depth of the impression. So you want to push it all the way to get the full depth, get all the structures, get the peripheral roll and the frenum. Technically, the peripheral roll is the, what, what are the frenums between? Huh? Yeah, like what, what are they, huh? No, like, well, we have a labial frenum, buccal frenum. What is that space in between them, for example? What do we call that? Vestibule, right? The vestibule. So the peripheral role technically are the vestibules on the patient. Okay. And on the impression, it's these things here. See how a nice role that we have there. And we have even the frenum attachment. You see how the frenums are clear in here. I know this is a bad impression. I mean, generally, because we took all of that, but it's a great impression because you have all of that nice role representing the vestibule and all the frenum attachment that you see in there captured. That's a great impression because they have all of that. You know, as you can see, they captured all of the palate here, all of the teeth. So. You don't want to see large. Same thing like what we, we don't want to see on the cast bubbles or voids right voids would be a better word for that and the mouth and now any questions now Let's just watch a video for an algen impression, which I should have done before I start talking about all of this. <laughs> so you can relate much more better, I think. Um, but all of these videos, again, are on Canvas. Let me stop recording here um, to get that done. And then we'll watch a video, maybe other videos here that we have. So.